In this video, we will discuss the United States healthcare system before and after the 1960s. This presentation was made at the Southwestern Society of Economists on March 14th of 2019. My name is Kirby R. Cundiff. I have a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. I'm currently a collegiate professor of finance and chair of accounting and financial management for the University of Maryland University College's Graduate School. In this presentation, we will study the outcomes and structure of the United States healthcare system before and after the 1960s. During the 1960s, the Food and Drug Administration, Medicare, and Medicaid were all created. We find that after the 1960s, the regular increase in the lifespan of Americans decreased in pace, healthcare became way more expensive, and the bureaucracy of the U.S. healthcare system drastically increased. Problems with the current U.S. healthcare system include slowing increases in lifespan. Now we actually have decreases in lifespan post Obamacare, huge administrative expenses, constantly increasing costs, and high costs relative to the world for the same services. This graph shows the trend line for the increase in life expectancy from 1900 to today and the actual increase in life expectancy. Note that the increase in life expectancy trended up at a much quicker rate before the 1960s. Since then, it has gone down significantly. So if the trend from the early half of the 20th century had continued, the average lifespan of Americans would be in the 90s, whereas the average lifespan of Americans is below 80. It is possible that somehow medical technology has hit a wall where human lifespans cannot be increased that much. It is also possible that uh, barriers such as regulatory problems with the Food and Drug Administration and limitation on access to doctors due to licensing laws has caused a decrease in the increase in lifespans. Much of the increase in lifespans in the early part of the 20th century was due to simple things that we or at least consider simple today, like indoor plumbing and also the widespread use of antibiotics to fight infection. Um, there has been progress since the 1960s in areas like treating heart disease. Areas like cancer have been uh, far less receptive to modern treatments. The same trend has occurred in Great Britain. We see very little change in lifespan from the 1700s until around the Industrial Revolution. We see a huge increase in lifespans between 1900 and around World War II. Again, modern plumbing is introduced, antibiotics are introduced. Post-World War II, that increase decreases drastically after Great Britain went to their current socialized medical scheme. One of the problems with the current health care system is most of the health care is paid for through third party payments. Before 1950s, generally if you went to a doctor, you would pay the doctor directly. Or perhaps you would have insurance through something like the Odd Fellows or some sort of a professional organization. This started to change during World War II due to wage and price controls due to wage and price controls in World War II, it was illegal for employers to increase their employees' salaries. To attract employees, they came up with a concept called the benefit, and one of these benefits was health care. After World War II, the IRS tried to tax this benefit. There were arguments back and forth. Um, employers were finally allowed to create this, basically, pre-tax benefits to employees, the biggest of which was health care. The incentive, therefore, is for employees not to pay for their own health care, but for employers to pay for health care. As a result of this, in most situations, employees don't really care what health care costs. They just say, hey, give it to me, and the employer is stuck with the bill. This results in um, less incentives to control costs, and we can see that healthcare expenditures have gone up drastically as the percentage that is paid for by third parties has gone up. 
So by around 1950, only a third of health care was paid for by third parties. Today, almost all, over 80% of health care is paid for by third parties. During that same time period, the percentage of the economy absorbed by health care in the United States has gone from around 4% to in excess of 12, and this has continued since this graph was finished. Another way of examining the drastic increase in health care costs since the 1960s is looking at how long someone has to work for various items or services. The yellow bars here indicate the average number of work days at the average hourly wage required for the purchase in 1958 of a toaster, a TV, and an iPod versus a washer and dryer versus average health care spending. So an individual would have to have worked 23 days to be able to purchase a toaster, TV, and iPod in 1958. That has decreased to 3.3 days today. A washer and dryer has gone down from around 23 days to four days from 1958 to near today. Whereas healthcare spending has gone from around 15 days up to close to two months. In most industries, as technology gets better, costs go down. It's much easier to produce a washer and dryer today. In healthcare, for some reason, the claim is that technology pushes up costs. Things like x rays, which are 100 year old technology, are still very expensive at the same time that photographs on your cell phone are now basically free. This is due to the fact that healthcare is not a competitive industry and you are not paying market wages for healthcare products. Here is another similar graph showing from 1997 until around today of how prices have changed for various items. TVs have dropped drastically in price. Software, cell phones have also gone down significantly. Items like new cars, clothing have stayed roughly the same. And there has been a small increase in food, beverages, housing, wages going up more than those. The areas that have gone up the most drastically in costs are hospital services, college tuition and textbooks, child care, and more medical services. It is worth noting that these are the areas the government in the United States has become most involved in. Health care is primarily paid with government payment, third-party payments. College tuition is primarily paid with student loans, and colleges are also subsidized. All of this government subsidies creates a demand shift that causes these costs to go up and makes them not very competitive. People don't generally shop around for these services based on price. Well, it is questionable whether or not individuals, patients have benefited from all of the increase in healthcare spending since the 1960s, one group of people that have benefited drastically are physicians. This graph shows from 1930 until today the number of physicians and their income, where we have physicians per 100,000 in the civilian population here in the pink line, which is going up some, more so in the 80s and 2000s, and the income, physician mean net income, divided by per capita income, so their income relative to the general population, is in the blue line. Note from the time period when health care was made a third-party payment due to the tax code during World War II, up until the 1960s changes in subsidies in Medicare and Medicaid, physicians went from making four times the average American income, or per capita income, to close to nine times the per capita income. Physicians obviously now are on average rather wealthy people. As a result of this, of course, in the 60s and 70s, a lot more people wanted to go to medical school. This increase in doctors 
has caused these salaries to go down somewhat, but doctors still make above certainly what they did before all the government interference in the healthcare market. Critics of the American Medical Association, including Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman, have asserted that the organization acts more like a guild or a labor union and has attempted to increase physicians' wages and fees by limiting the supply and competition for physicians. For example, the AMA has engaged in extensive litigation trying to outlaw osteopathic physicians. I'm from Crossville, Missouri, which is the birthplace of osteopathic medicine. They have also done their best to limit chiropractors from being in the medical field. The Council on Medical Education and Hospitals, also largely run by the AMA, approves both medical schools and hospitals, and they do the best they can to limit the number of approved medical schools, limit the number of applicants to those schools, and limit the number of physicians coming on the market. This decreases people's access to medical care, probably leading to premature deaths, and certainly increases the overall wages and cost of the healthcare system drastically. The AMA also has strong influence on what doctors get paid for their services, since most of healthcare now is done by third-party payments, and a large fraction of that is by the federal government through Medicare and Medicaid. The Medicare reimbursement rates largely determine what doctors get paid, even for private insurance. An organization known as the Relative Value Upscale Committee sets Medicare reimbursement costs, and doctors from the AMA sit on this committee. Therefore, in many ways, the doctors, not the free market, get to determine what they get paid for their services. Well, the increase in doctors' salaries has contributed to the drastic increase in health care costs. In recent years, it is probably not the dominant factor. This graph shows the growth of physicians and administrators from 1970 to 2009. Note the amount of doctors increasing is relatively small down here. The number of administrators has increased drastically. So when you go to a doctor or a hospital, you're paying a large amount of money to people who have nothing to do with the direct delivery of health care. The same system exists in the education sector, where over the last few decades, faculty salaries have barely kept pace with inflation, but tuition costs and the amount of money going into education have gone up drastically, the same reason the drastic increase in administration is involved. More comparisons of the United States with the rest of the world. This graph indicates how inefficient the United States healthcare system is. We have spending in US dollars on the left, and we can note that this is split up into private in red and public in blue, and we show the countries in the OECD, OECD the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Note the United States spends way more than anybody else, and in fact, just our public spending is above most of the other countries. If we add in the private spending, we are well above the other countries. While the U.S. spends all this money on health care, it seems to get very little for its expenditures. It is the highest country in the OECD as a function of health care spending. This graph shows the rankings of the OECD countries in each of these categories from zero up to around 30th. But while we spend more than any other country, we are in the lower third in life expectancy. We are in the top five in infant mortality. Uh, physicians per capita, we are also in the lower third. Nurses per capita, we're about average. Acute care beds per capita, we're in the lower third. MRI units per capita, we do better. CT scanners per capita, we're about average. Of course, this lack of medical services probably does contribute to the lower lifespan of Americans relative to many of these other countries. Uh, lifestyle effects could also be apparent. 
but the one that seems to be dominant is obesity. We're the most obese country in the OECD. Americans do not consume very much tobacco. In fact, the only country that smokes less than the U.S. is Canada. Alcohol consumption, we're in the lower third. And interestingly, in the OECD, a regression shows that alcohol consumption is positively correlated with lifespan, meaning the countries that drink more tend to live longer. In tobacco consumption, the countries that smoke more do tend to live less, but the results are not statistically significant. Obesity is very statistically significant, and Americans' obesity epidemic does probably contribute to our lower lifespan. This graph shows spending as a function of life expectancy. Note the countries that spend more tend to have a higher life expectancy. We can draw a trend line through here. The U.S. is an outlier. We spend way more than anybody else, but we're sort of in the middle on life expectancy. This graph shows the life expectancy versus doctors per capita. Again, the U.S. spends a ton of money, more than any other country in the OECD, but it's in the lower third on doctors per capita, and there does seem to be a correlation between increasing numbers of doctors and increasing lifespan. So if the money spent actually increased the number of physicians, it is likely the U.S. would lie up in here somewhere. Life expectancy versus obesity. Uh, more obese people and more obese countries tend to have a lower lifespan. The trend line would tend to go like this. The U.S. is an outlier. Um, we have higher obesity rates than any other country in the OECD. Recent developments um, with Obamacare being passed, lifespan in the U.S. has gotten even worse. In fact, it is now going down. Uh, doctors have probably not benefited from the passage of Obamacare. In fact, due to the high compliance costs, particularly with the record reporting system, a large number of doctors have decided to take early retirement. In my hometown, I was recently sitting with a group of individuals complaining that all three of the eye doctors had decided to retire post-Obamacare, and there are currently no do eye doctors available within around a 90-mile radius. The organizations that have done very well under Obamacare are insurance companies. If you're forced to purchase their product, they can charge about anything they want to for it. And medical record companies, again, if the doctors are forced to purchase their product, they can charge about everything they want to it. And these medical record requirements um, have made it largely so private practice physicians have retired. My cousin, who's a medical doctor, basically said this has eliminated private practice in healthcare. So the only way doctors can really survive now are by joining hospitals, are getting together in large groups. The time of the small private practice physician is basically over. This graph shows lifespan of Americans from 1960 until today. Um, again, the trend line has been positive, although at a de decreasing rate since before World War II. Uh, Post-Obamacare, now Americans' lifespan is actually going down. And noted, the U.S. since the 1990s is now well below its peer countries, Australia, France, Canada, Finland, U.K., in life expectancy. This graph shows the performance of Cerner Corporation, which is a healthcare record uh, reporting company in Kansas City, Missouri. They employed a lot of my students when I worked for Park University. ACA was passed in 2010. Cerner's stock skyrocketed. Since that time period, it has gone up by around 800%. So ACA has been very good to Cerner. They now own a lot of different buildings and a lot of different campuses in the Kansas City area, plus, of course, buildings in other cities. It turned the founder of Cerner into a billionaire when Obamacare was passed. He has since died. Cigna and other medical insurance companies similarly have done very well since Obamacare was passed. 
Again, Obamacare was passed in 2010. Since then, Cigna has gone up by a factor of 400%, and other healthcare companies have done similarly well. So what could government do to cut down on the problems with the U.S. healthcare system? One of the things they could do is allow the importation of cheaper overseas drugs, in many cases 10 or even 5 cents on the dollar, compared to U.S. prices. Instead, they've been prosecuting UPS and FedEx for importing overseas drugs. They could eliminate certificate of need programs that try and limit competition in various states for health care. About half of the states have these kind of programs. They can make all drugs available over the counter. Um, in much of the world, including Dubai, where I previously lived, with non-narcotics, you can just walk into the pharmacy. The pharmacist can basically sell you whatever you want, and they can even give you medical advice. You don't have to go to a doctor. Other people beyond pharmacists, PhDs in biology, nurses, etc., are also qualified to give you medical advice. But in many cases, they can be prosecuted if they do so for practicing medicine without a license. The government could also change the tax code so medical expenses are treated the same for individuals and corporations. This way, individuals, as opposed to their employers, could buy and shop for their own health care. This would create competitive pressure in the market, which would decrease costs. We could also allow individuals to hire cheap overseas unskilled labor. In the United States, um, cost for, for example, nursing homes are extremely high. In a place like Dubai, you could just hire a maid from the Philippines for $600 a month to take care of your elderly family member. As noted, both FedEx and UPS have been sued by the United States government for drug trafficking for allowing individuals to buy cheap drugs from overseas. UPS settled with the United States. FedEx was able to beat them. About half of the United States, individual states, have certificate of need programs. The idea behind a certificate of need is the state limits competition. They call this duplication of services, and the state will argue that if one location has too many hospital beds, this duplication of services would increase costs, and they make it illegal for a hospital to provide more hospital beds than the state thinks it needs. They can also limit the number of specialties in a given area and many, many other healthcare services. In any other industry, this would be called competition. Some of my friends in the Joplin, Missouri area moved their medical services across to Kansas because it would be much cheaper to offer them there since Kansas does not have a certificate of need program and Missouri does. My mom recently died. She was in a nursing home in my hometown which costs around $4,000 a month for very low quality care. This didn't include even things like soda, wine, apples, or diapers. In Estonia, where my wife is from, much better medical services in nursing homes are available for around $1,000 a month. In Dubai, you could hire a maid from the Philippines for under 1,000, maybe 600 a month to live with you to provide most of the same healthcare services the nursing home provides. This would be an area where the United States could alter its immigration policies and allow individuals or corporations to sponsor people to come into the country and provide necessary services. In Dubai, if you want to sponsor somebody, it can be done in a couple of days. In the U.S., getting the ability to work here could take years. And of course, with healthcare services in nursing homes, they will attempt to get all of the money out of you or the government they possibly can. For the first month, my, the nursing home my mom was at attempted to bill the insurance company $25,000. They ended up paying $4,000. In general, 
insurance companies and Medicare do not cover any nursing home expenses except for the first few months when possibly the care is related to rehabilitation. In her case, the first few months were related to trying to be able to get her to walk again since she fell down and injured her hip. Overall, in the five years my mom stayed in the nursing home, we spent around $300,000 out of pocket. This was everything my dad saved in liquid wealth during his entire life, including what he inherited from his father. This is a massive transfer of wealth from families to the healthcare industry. Since it is unlikely that the U.S. government is actually going to improve health care in the United States, it could get even worse, um, it is worth looking at what individuals can do to improve their health care. There are lobbyists from the American Medical Association, the insurance companies, the drug companies. They all want to keep the system the way it is or perhaps, again, make it even worse for the individual. So what can you do? One of the easiest things, if your employer allows you to, is to get a health savings account. If your employer gives you a high deductible insurance policy, then you can get an HSA, which will allow you to control some of your own health care spending. Other items include self-testing and treatment. There are lots of tests you can now dish, uh, buy over Amazon over the internet. If you travel overseas or you can order online, you can buy overseas drugs. You can get very cheap um, prescription glasses on the internet. Many ways of avoiding costs associated with the regular healthcare system. Medical tourism is also an option. Um, I was in Belize over Christmas. I was able to get in within uh, 24 hours to see a dentist and get a dental cleaning for $40 quite professional, well done, the same service would have cost me $200 in my hometown. So health savings accounts, again, are available for individuals and families. If they have a high deductible policy through their employer, minimum annual deductibles are $1,300 for self-only coverage or $2,600 for family coverages. Um, if you have one of these policies, then just like with an IRA, you are allowed to set aside money pre-tax, up to $3,350 as an individual, $6,650 as a family, or higher if you are over age 55. If you spend this money on health care, then you never have to pay taxes on it. If you don't spend it on health care, then you can basically use it as a supplement to your retirement account. Examples of the kinds of tests you can do yourself. You can order something like a cardio check system that allows you to check your own cholesterol, HDL, LDL, um, triglycerides. You can buy similar systems to be able to test your sugar levels. All this can be done at home. You don't have to deal with a doctor. Um, a test that is also a good thing to do as you get older would be a fecal immunochemical test to test for the possibility of you having or, um, colon cancer. This is much cheaper and easier than a colonoscopy and in as many cases is close to being as accurate. If you wish to engage in self-treatment, um, I as mentioned get sinus infections. Well, you could buy antibiotics overseas probably import them in the United States. If you do not travel overseas, you can buy things like fish antibiotics, which are still available over the counter. Um, basically, they're the exact same antibiotics as used on humans, but they're much cheaper and available without a prescription. You'll just have to be able to measure out the right quantities to treat yourself. As previously mentioned, drug costs overseas tend to be a fraction of costs in the United States. Since I worked in Dubai for three years, I will do some comparisons between the U.S. and the United Arab Emirates. I get sinus infections in the United States if I go to a pharmacy. I will need a script to buy a nasal spray called Nasonex, and it costs $350 a bottle. The same product is available in Dubai for $25 a bottle, over-the-counter are in Istanbul for around $5 a bottle. This product there was imported largely from Belgium. 
Most non-narcotic drugs are available over the counter in Dubai, as they are in Southeast Asia, much of Latin America. Dubai has largely a free market healthcare system. You might get insurance from your employer, but in most cases, you don't even need it. If I wanted to, I could get a doctor's appointment there within a few hours, just calling them on the telephone. They would be able to get me in. I would be able to get blood tests, x-rays, talk to the doctor, um, go get um, various drugs, and generally the cash costs would be under $100, no insurance necessary. While healthcare in Dubai was very cheap, housing was extremely expensive. The reason for this is Dubai had largely cash pay free market health care, but their housing market was structured quite similarly to the way the U.S. structures its medical market. Housing was largely paid for through third parties. Your employer would give you a voucher. That voucher, maybe $40,000 a year, you would spend on rent. In the United States, you don't care what health care costs because your employer pays for it. In Dubai, you don't care what housing costs because your employer pays for it. So you would just shop around and you would attempt to find housing and you didn't care about the cost as long as it was below your voucher. This shows in both cases how third-party payments drastically increase costs. I have written several articles on healthcare related issues. Many of them are available through the Foundation for Economic Education. Just go to fee.org and search under my name, Kirby Cundiff. I also have some papers at the Independent Institute on life expectancy, um, healthcare and economics, and some on infant mortality. I urge you to read these articles. And I thank you for watching this video.